Yeah. Just a moment. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Just a moment. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we can start. Yeah. Hello everyone, I am Eddie Tribaskoro. Good afternoon, good evening, and probably good morning to all of you from various time zones. Welcome again to our combinatorial today series. We are very happy to see you again in the second year of this series. First of all, I would like to extend our gratitude to the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, ITB, Professor Wahyu Sri Kutomo for the constant support to this event. In fact, he's always here with us to allocate his valuable time. And thank you so much. Our big welcome to today's speakers for this event. Professor Hao Huang, one of young productive combinatorists from National University of Singapore. He proved the famous sensi sensitivity conjecture in last July 2019. Yeah. And the proof is only in two pages for this conjecture of nearly 30 years old. And even theoretical computer scientist Scott Aronson said to the proof that I find it hard to imagine that even God knows how to prove the sensitivity conjecture in any simpler way than this. And then Huang received an NSF Career Award in 2019 and a Sloan Research uh, Fellowship in 2020. Hello, Professor uh, Hao Huang. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. So th thank you uh, very much for accepting our invitation to deliver a lecture here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay. So in this occasion, I, I also would like to welcome all of all colleagues, friends and students at, uh, who, who are attending this program. We are really happy to have you here. And this program is organized by the Combinatorial Mathematics Research Group, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Institute of Technology, Bandung, Indonesia. And in this program, we will, this year, we will have uh, 14 editions of this uh, series. And the speakers are all outstanding combinatories from uh, various countries. And now we are all very excited and honored to have Professor Hao Huang from the National University of uh, Singapore. Before I give the control to the uh, Dr. Shwadri as uh, the uh, moderator of this uh, uh, today's program, I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Professor Wahyu Sri Kutomo to give a welcoming speech. Professor Wahyu, time is yours. Thank you, uh, Eddie. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, everyone uh, here from Bandung uh, in Western Indonesian time. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Prof. Eddie Tribaskoro, Professor Eddie from the uh, Combinatorial Mathematics Research Group and all colleagues uh, in the Department of Mathematics for or organizing this activity, namely Combinatorics Today series. And now is uh, the number four, uh, which is a continuous event involving combinatoric resource persons from various circles around the world. I hope that this event 
uh, will bring optimum benefits and can become an arena for exchanging scientific uh, information, knowledge, and ideas among participants, especially our researchers and young students. I, uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude and uh, thank you and thanks to uh, uh, Professor Hao Huang from National University of Singapore. Uh, your lecture uh, will inspire and motivate combinatoric activities uh, around the world and as well as in, in uh, Indonesia uh, and uh, will deepen and apply this uh, and make it enable, more enable to apply this field in various aspects. So to all the participants, uh, have a good time with this lecture and wish you all pleasant time. Stay healthy always from FMIPA ITB. Thank you very much. Terima kasih and thank you, uh, Professor Wahyu, for the, uh, <clears throat> for the speech. And before we go to Dr. Suhadi, let us uh, take a, a group photo. Yeah, this is uh, probably one of the most uh, important things to do. <laughs> okay, but Yusuf, can you uh, help us? Uh, every, for every participant, please uh, open your camera so we could take the photo. Uh, I will wait. Uh, around 30 seconds. Okay, uh, I will take a screenshot of this Zoom meeting in one, two, three, Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. And now, uh, please, uh, Dr. Suwati, uh, chair this uh, session. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Edi Tribasoro. So uh, now I will uh, chair these sessions. And before uh, we start the presentations from Professor Hao Huang. So I will uh, share screen first. Okay. Uh, Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and probably good evening for all participants of the fourth Combinatorics Today series in 2022 from various time zones. Uh, my name is Suhadi Oghido Saputro. I'm uh, the moderator for this Combinatorics Today series. I'm very pleased to see you here and welcome to our participants to the seminar. Uh, the theme of this fourth series is about uh, interlacing methods in external combinatorics. And the talk will be given by Professor Hao Huang. He is a great combinatorist and graph theorist from National University of Singapore. Uh, he received background degree from uh, Peking University, uh, China and he continued his study on PhD degree in University of California, Los Angeles, uh, USA. Uh, he uh, started his career as a postdoctoral member at Institute for Advanced Study, Princeton and Dimax Radier in 2012. In 2014, he was accepted as postdoctoral fellow at Institute for Mathematics and its applications for the annual program, discrete structure analysis and applications. And then one year later, he became uh, an assistant professor at Emory University, Atlanta, USA. And now currently he is an associate 
Associate Professor at National University of Singapore. He has published 24, around 24 papers in a number of top level international journal, including Journal of Combinatorial Theory uh, in both series, series A and B, uh, Journal of Graph Theory, Siam Journal on Discrete Mathematics, and Annals of Mathematics. In uh, 2020, he was awarded ACCM Best uh, Paper Award and received gold medal. He's working on sensitivity conjecture, also covered by some medias. The working was ranked uh, number 28 in Discover Magazine uh, Top Science Stories of uh, 2019. It was also covered by multiple academic blogs and various magazines, including Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society, Communication of the SCM, Quantum Magazine, Life Science, and some scientific magazine from France, Spain, and Korea. He is also an associate editor of Annals of Combinatoric and referee for many mathematical and combinatorial journals. He is also a reviewer for Mathematical Reviews, Cambridge University Press, and American Mathematical Society. So now, let allow me to welcome the speaker. Professor Hao Huang to deliver his presentations. The audience who wants to ask a question can ask directly in discussion in the discussion sessions after Professor gives his talk, or you can write your question on the chat room. So, Professor Hao Huang, the time is yours. Yeah, Dr. Swati thank you for the introduction. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Baskolo for the invitation and in uh, what you script to more for, for the opening remark. Okay, so now let me share my screen. All right, so today the topic of my talk will be on interlacing methods in digital combinatorics. And the main tool I will introduce today will be how to use the Cauchy's interlacing theorem to help us understand various graph parameters like the click number, independence number, or the maximum degree of the induced subgraph. So first, what is more combinatorics? So it's that is how large or how small a collection of finite objects could be. So here, these objects could be anything. It comes from numbers to graphs to vectors to sets and so on. So it could be any discrete object that you could imagine. So basically, we want to uh, impose certain restrictions on this family of finite objects, and we'd like to ask how large or how small it could be. So let me start by a toy example. So suppose you have a family F of subsets, and every element, so every set is a subset of this n element set from 1 to n. So such family is called intersecting if whenever you pick two sets A and B, the intersection is now empty. So we can ask the following simple question. So how large can an uh, intersecting family of subsets be? So if you think a moment, you'll realize that the answer is actually very simple. So it's two to the hand minus one. And why is that? So first of all, you can construct such a family of subset with two to the n minus one sets. So that is intersecting. So for example, you can take every set that contains one. You see, then the intersection of any two subsets must also contain one, right? So it's obviously intersecting. But you cannot do better than this because you can always pair a set S with complement. So this gives you two to the n minus one pairs of subsets, right? Because in total, you have two to the n subsets and you can put them into two to the n minus one pairs. But you see, for every set with complement, you can only select at most one for your intersecting family. If you select both of them, then the intersection becomes empty. Therefore, you can only pick at most two to the n minus one. So the answer to this is more combinatorial question becomes two to the n minus one. Okay, so this looks like a very nice question. So we can ask, what happens if we only allow our subset to have size exactly equal to k? Then this problem becomes less trivial. But at least we can try to imitate this construction here. Instead of taking every set that contains one, you can take every set of size k that contains one. So let's see how many this, how much this gives us. So, so basically we are looking at a construction which people usually call your star. So you take all the K subset that contains a fixed element one. So this gives you a total of M minus one, choose K minus one subset, and this is intersecting. 
So mm. her is called and rather in 1961. So that this is basically the best you can do as long as n is too, not too small. So if n is greater or equal to 2k, then the largest intersecting family of k subsets of an n element set has size n minus 1 to k minus 1. And this is the optimal example. So you can also prove certain stability result about this. And the reason that for n less than 2k, this is not true is because if there are at most 2k minus 1 elements in your ground set, then you can take any k subset. These two of them must always intersect because there's simply not enough space to have two different subsets. All right, so basically we have completely settled this problem for any fixed k and arbitrary n. But in today's talk, I would like to view this as a problem of an independence number of the graph. So here, the graph we are considering is the so-called Knazer graph. So this, I use this notation kg of nk. So there are two parameters, n and k. Both are integers, and n is greater or equal to 2k. Mm. And the way we define the edges of this, or the way we define the vertices of this graph is the following. So just take all the k subset of the n elements set as its vertices. And for edges, we just connect a pair of distribution subsets. Mm -hmm. So here is the example of kg 5, 2. So n is equal to 5 and k is equal to 2. So you take all these 5 to 2 pairs of, of elements from, by, from 1 to 5. And then you put an edge uh, between, let's say, uh, 3, 4, and 1, 5, because that's distribution 3, 4, and 2, 5, and 3, 4, and 1, 2. Okay. But you don't connect, for example, 3, 4, and 2, 4, because they share the same element 4. So by doing this, you can get a very familiar graph, which is the Peterson graph, which is KG52. You can get, or get other highly symmetric graph in a similar way. But what's, why this is interesting for our purpose? Because if you know the independence number of this graph, then this will tell you this or this correlate to here. So here, what I mean by the independence number alpha, so if you have a graph G, then alpha of G is just the maximum number of vertices so that they are pairwise non-adjacent. So you want to find as many vertices as possible so that they induce the empty subgraph. All right, so in this particular example, so I don't know if you can quickly see like what the independence number is. So you can definitely find, let's say, 3, 4, and then maybe you can take uh, 2, 4, and then you can take 1, 4, and 4, 5. You can see all these four vertices are pairwise not adjacent. And no matter how you pick five vertices, there must be an edge in the induced subgraph. So in this case, the independence number k alpha of kg52 is equal to 4. And it turns out that as long as n is greater or equal to 2k, uh, we can prove that this independence number is equal to n minus 1, which is k minus 1. So at this moment, you can probably guess how I pick this independence set, right? Because I just take everything that contains a fixed element four, for example. You can do this for one as well. And by the definition of the Knazer graph, this independence number gives you exactly the largest size of the intersecting family. Okay, so here's another way of taking this independence set by picking everything that contains one. All right, so now for such a highly symmetric graph, how can we find its independence number? And this is uh, when the special graph theory could play a role here. So whenever we have an undirected graph G, we can associate with it uh, adjacency matrix of G. So usually we use this notation A G, A sub G. So basically what we do here is, let's say the vertices of G are from one to five. Then we can label the rows and the columns of this matrix by the vertex set of G. And then we put a, element one if these two corresponding vertices are adjacent. So for example, in our graph, one and two are adjacent, that corresponds to these two copies of ones. And one and five adjacent, this corresponds to these two copies of uh, ones. And if they're not adjacent, then we we'll put a uh, zero. So by doing this, we get a zero one symmetric matrix. And the property of being symmetric is useful because we can consider the eigenvalues of this matrix and all the eigenvalues are real numbers. And often knowing some information about the eigenvalues can tell us about certain information on the graph parameters as well. Mm. So for example, it's, it's extremely useful if we like to understand what's the maximum number of vertices so that they're pairwise not adjacent or adjacent or the minimum number of colors we need to color the vertices so that two adjacent vertices get different colors. So 
Here, a very important tool uh, used in this study of like special graph theory is the so-called Cauchy Sinclair lace theorem. So here we start with a matrix M, A, which is the N by N symmetric matrix. And B is a principal sub matrix of A of size M less or equal to N. So here you can assume that M is strictly less than N. Okay. So it's F plus M minus one, I think that's better. So now we know these two matrices are both symmetric, right? Because if you begin with any symmetric matrix and test principal sub matrix, the sub principal sub matrix still remains symmetric. Now we know for both matrices, the eigenvalues are real numbers. So we can sort them in descending order. So we can assume that the, the larger matrix A has eigenvalues lambda one down to lambda n, and the smaller matrix B has eigenvalues lambda, as a mu one down to mu n. So both of them are in descending order. Then Cauchy's interlace theorem tells us that the i's largest eigenvalue of the large matrix is greater or equal to the i's largest eigenvalue of the small matrix. And if you look at the j's smallest eigenvalue of the large matrix, it's actually less or equal to the j's smallest eigenvalue of the small matrix. So actually, if you want to establish both inequality, you just need to prove, for example, the, this one. And then you take minus one times this matrix A, then minus B becomes its principal sub matrix, and then you can use the previous inequality and get the one for the J smallest eigenvalue. So here, since I write everything in descending order, that's why I have this I plus N minus N. So now how do we prove causes in the last theorem? So there are many different ways, and the simplest way is probably you can apply this Kuruan Fisho while we must bring support. So this basically tells you if you have a symmetric matrix A, how do you compute the case largest eigenvalue? So you can write this as the mean of max or max of mean of the so-called ready quotient. Okay. And then from there, I think the cosy Lace theorem is almost automatic. And actually, there's a pretty lovely proof using polynomial interlacing, which fits into one page. So I think this was proved by Steve Fisk. Okay. All right, so, so from now, I will just assume that the cosy interlacing theorem is true, and I'll just show you some applications of it. So it gives us some very useful bound, um, for example, the independence number of a graph. So once Easy result we can immediately prove is the following. This is the so-called inertial bound developed by Spakovich. So uh, the independence number of a graph G is always bounded from above by the minimum of these two parameters. So here I did not give you the definition, so let me explain what this means. So AG is the adjacency matrix of the graph. So here we just have the 0, 1 symmetric matrix. But later you can see this can be generalized to the so-called pseudo-adjacency matrix. And this n greater or equal to zero means the number of non-negative eigenvalues of this matrix H. Okay. So here I consider all the positive ones also zero. And this n less or equal to zero, of course, means the number of non-positive eigenvalues. Now it turns out that both quantities gives you upper bound of the independence number of G. So let me give you a very simple example to show that at least for some graphs, this is sharp. So let's say if you take Km, which is the complete graph on M vertices, then the adjacency matrix is the following. So you have zero on the diagonal and one off diagonal. Then you can prove that the largest eigenvalue is equal to M minus one, and the rest of the eigenvalues are all equal to minus one. Okay. So now what's the number of non-negative eigenvalues? So it's equal to one, right? There's only one positive and no zero eigenvalues. And the number of non-positive eigenvalues is equal to M minus one. But I can pick the smaller number to bound the independence number. So you can see the independence number in this case is less than equal to one, which is of course very obvious. But it turns out that for some other interesting graph, this is can quite be tight sometimes. All right, so now let's, let me show you the proof of this. So it just follows immediately from the cosy interlacing. Why is that? So you take the adjacency matrix of your graph G and you consider independence set. You can look at, for example, the maximum independence set. So this corresponds to all zero principal sub matrix, right? If you take a induced subgraph, then this adjacency matrix is basically the uh, principal sub matrix. On, on the corresponding rows and columns. All right, so now we know that 
all the eigenvalues of this small matrix are zero, and in particular, the alpha's largest eigenvalue is equal to zero. Now, this tells us for the larger matrix AG, it has at least alpha not negative eigenvalues. So this is how we get this first upper bound. And now you can do the same if you start counting from the smaller, like smallest eigenvalues and you obtain the other bound similarly. And it turns out that actually you can use a more sophisticated version of interlacing to get a, a very different uh, a very different upper bound called the so-called ratio bound. So by the way, for this name inertial bound, the name comes from this so-called Sylvester law of inertia. So it basically tell you up to certain transformation, the number of positive, zero, and negative eigenvalue remains constant. And here for this ratio bound, instead of counting the number of eigenvalues of certain type, you want to compare uh, different eigenvalues. So here, what you compare is the largest and the smallest eigenvalues. It turns out that for any regular uh, graph, the independence number is bounded from above by the number of vertices times the, so this is basically the absolute value of the smallest eigenvalue because the smallest one is always non-positive. And then you divide this by the gap between the largest and the smallest eigenvalue. And this could also be useful. And sometimes it gives you a tight upper bound. For example, you can do the same for Kn. So you can realize that lambda max is equal to m minus one and lambda min is equal to max one. If you plug this into the inequality, again, this gives you alpha of g is at most one. So the proof of this uses a different version of interlacing, which basically says that you don't have to take a principal sub matrix of, of, of uh, B of A. You can take a principal sub matrix B of P transpose times A times P. So here, uh, I mean use P, but I mean maybe it's a better ways to use U. So you can take any unitary matrix and then you take this U transpose times A times U. So it basically has the same eigenvalue. Then you can take a principal sum matrix of that matrix. So in particular, this shows you that if you start from this uh, adjacency matrix of U and you can divide this into block matrices and you can compress this block matrices by taking the average row sum of each block, then the resulting matrix has eigenvalues interlacing with the eigenvalues of this large matrix A. So if you apply this to this uh, irregular and vertex graph, then you just get this ratio bound. All right, so now we can see for complete graphs, both bounds gives you a tight upper bound, but does the same work for other examples? So here, let's note that a complete graph is just a very special case of a kinesic graph by taking K equals one, right? and could be arbitrary. And it turns out that we can actually compute the eigenvalues of any kinesic graph. And the j, I mean, if you compare the absolute value, then the j's largest eigenvalue is equal to minus one to the j times, okay, so I saw a question from Lawrence. Is it possible to get lambda mass equals lambda mean? Do you mean lambda mass equals minus one times lambda mean? Uh, because you see the sum of the odd eigenvalues is equal to the trace of the matrix. So, and the trace is equal to zero. So if the maximum is equal to the minimum, then all of them are equal to zero. And I think you end up with an empty graph. But it's possible to have lambda mass equals to negative one times lambda mean. For example, for all the bipartite graphs, this eigenvalue are symmetric above zero. I hope that answers your question. Okay. All right, so good. So, all right, so for kinesic graphs, so we know precisely what its eigenvalues are. So it turns out that J's eigenvalue is equal to this quantity, which is a binomial coefficient, and it has multiplicity n choose j minus n choose j minus one. So if you add up all these uh, differences, you get precisely n choose k, which is not very surprising. But right? now, if you plot this into both bounds, most of them will give you a tight upper bound on the independence number connects graph, which means this will prove uh, all this Corrado theorem in two different ways. So, okay, so I'm not going to do the computation. So for the first one, it's quite straightforward. You just you know, com to compute this ratio. And for the second one, it's slightly more interesting because it's not so obvious to see that so first of all, uh, you see the size of these uh, eigenvalues are alternating. So I think the first one is positive and the negative, positive and so on. So basically you have to 
add up this n tray, this multiplicity for every odd tray, this gives you the number of non negative eigenvalues. If you do this for even tray, that gives you the number of non positive eigenvalues. There's no zero here. So it turns out that uh, depending on the parity of maybe k or n, then this minimum is always equal to n minus one to k minus one. So one of these quantities is equal to n minus one to k minus one, the other is equal to, I think, n minus one to k, and they sum up to be n to k. So this is a slightly less obvious fact, but it can be proved. So basically what I want to convey here is that both bounds gives you a proof of this, uh, this Colorado theory. All right, so it turns out that we can say a little bit more about this uh, this Colorado theorem. So with Professor E. Zhao from Georgia State University, so in 2017, so established a so-called degree version of the Erdis uh, Colorado theorem. So what we do here is, instead of saying that an intersetting family of k subsets has at most n minus one to k minus one sets, we can basically prove that the Le uh, the least popular element in this uh, ground set is contained at most n minus two to k minus two subsets of f. So what does this mean? So you can think of this as the degree version of this Erdős Colorado theorem because if you view this as a hypergraph, then counting how many k subsets contain a fixed element i basically gives you the degree of this vertex i. So you want to find this minimum degree of this so-called intersecting hypergraph. And it turns out that for our result, we really need n to be greater or equal to 2k plus 1. So because for n equals 2k, this is not true. And also let me explain where this n must 2 to k must come from. So it's essentially the same example by taking every k set that contains a fixed element 1. So now you can see the most popular element is one, which is contained in n minus one to k minus one sets. But for any other element, it's contained only in n minus two to k minus two sets. So what we prove is, uh, as long as this family is intersecting, the least popular element is always contained in at most n minus two to k minus two subsets. Okay, so why is this result interesting? Because it actually implies the earliest Colorado theorem. So you, let's say if you want to prove the Earth's Colorado theorem, you want to show that f is less or equal to m minus one to k minus one. So you can apply our theorem and you take the least popular element, you delete it. Then if n is still above two k plus one, you can delete another least popular element. And so you keep doing this process until you hit n equals two k. So this is like the base case of the induction. And if you want to prove this case, you can use the old trick. You can pair every k set with complement and use the fact that 2k minus 1 to k minus 1 is exactly half of 2k to k. So for the base case, it's just a simple proof, which is exactly the same as our proof for, for this toy example. And then our degree version can be used in the inductive step. And this gives you a different proof of the Erdős Colorado theorem. All right, so now I said this moment, we can arrive at a very natural question. So uh, what happens if you consider pairs or triples? Can you say something similar? So in particular, this the following question is still open. Can you show that for any n greater or equal to 2k plus one, or maybe you can relax the range a little bit, let's say n greater or equal to 2k plus c for some constant c, which does not depend on k. Can you show that for every intersecting family of k sets of n, you can find a D triple contending at most n must be minus one to k must be minus one subsets of this intersecting family. So if this is true, then I think you can view this as a K degree, uh, sorry, D degree version of uh, this Colorado theorem. But unfortunately, we don't even know whether this is true or not for D equals two. So it is true that you can always find a pair contained in at most n minus three to k minus three subsets of f, as long as f is intersecting and n is not too small. I mean, if you assume that n is sufficiently large, let's say n is greater or equal to some constant times k squared, then this is not difficult. But what we are really interested in here is whether we can push this range down to a linear range or even to very close to two times k. All right, so I mentioned a couple of open problems during this talk. So, all right, so I'll, 
uh, we like to deviate uh, from this uh, Ernest Corrado theorem uh, moment to the so-called isoplane mesh inequality, which is one of the most famous results in the whole you know, mathematics. So the isoplane mesh inequality for the plane basically says that if you have a region in the plane bounded by a curve of fixed lengths, then the area of it can never exceed the area of a circle whose boundary has exactly the same length. So let's assume that the, the length of the boundary is equal to L. Then it basically tells you the area is at most L squared over four times pi. And of course the equality is attained by taking a, a disk. So here's a picture of uh, some, some history, some folklore history about where this isoplane mesh inequality, when this was first started. So according to a legend, I think a queen title uh, escaped maybe the modern, which is now the modern Italy, and went to the North African coast. And the local chieftain allowed her to purchase the land, which can be enclosed by an ox hide. And of course, Queen Diet was very smart and she knows exactly this type of isoplane mesh inequality. So she asked her companions to cut this ox hide into some small strips and tie them into a really long and thin strip. And then she also used the natural boundary of the North African coast and this very long strip made from ox hide. And this became the later famous uh, city of Carthage. Okay. Well, so I think for us mathematicians, maybe we will forget, like for example, to use the coastline and just make a disk. So here I would like to actually discuss a slightly different quality called isodimension inequality, which is slightly less well known, but in my personal opinion, is as fundamental as the isoparameter inequality. So here, instead of comparing the area with the parameter, so we would like to consider the area versus the diameter of this region. So let's say on the plan, or let's say any Euclidean space, you can define the diameter of a set to be the maximum distance between two points of this set. So for example, let's say if you take a unit disk, then the diameter is equal to two. So the ISO dimension inequality tells you basically the same result. So if you have a set which we have sufficiently nice, then and, and the diameter is fixed, then the maximum volume is attained when this set is a ball in R to the N. So here I can briefly sketch you the proof, and I will of course skip the most important step in this proof. So here to prove this, you can use the so-called Steiner's symmetrization technique. So you can start from this set S with nice properties, and you consider S minus S over two. So what this means is you take an element X from S and Y from S, and you consider all the points that can be expressed as X minus one over S minus Y over two. And this will give you this set S minus S over two. And it turns out that if you apply the triangle inequality, it tells you that the diameter of this new set after you apply this so-called symmetrization, is at most the diameter of the original set. So the diameter goes down. And on the other hand, the Brown-Minkowski inequality, which tells you that if you take two sets A and B, as long as they behave nicely, then the volume of the sum of these two sets to the power of one over n. So here I assume that both sets live in the space R to the n. This is greater or equal to the volume of A to the power of one over N plus the volume of B to the power of one over N. So now if you take A to be S over two and B to be minus S over two, you apply this result. Now you can see that the volume of this set S minus S over two after the symmetrization is greater or equal to the volume of the original set. All right, so suppose you would like to prove the isodimension inequality for an arbitrary set S. Now you can first apply the symmetrization. It turns out that the diameter decreases and the volume actually increases. So you just need to show that the inequality holds for the set after the symmetrization. But after the symmetrization, this set turns out to be located inside the ball of diameter uh, equal to the diameter of S. And that basically finishes the proof. So here, of course, I was cheating a little bit because I did not tell you how to prove this brown minkowski inequality as by no means trivial. All 
All right, so for us combinatorists, we're interested in the, usually the discrete version of these continuous problems. So for example, we can consider the isodimension inequalities on discrete cubes. So here I just want to mention that there's also a bunch of isoparametric inequalities on discrete objects, but this is not the main focus of today's talk. All right, so what's an isodimension inequality for a discrete hypercube? First, we have to understand what a cube is. So here you can think of this cube as a graph on two to the n vertices. So every vertex is just an n-dimensional binary string. Or you can think of this as a binary vector. So two vectors are adjacent if and only if they differ exactly one copy name. So I see people also call this a hemic graph. So for example, in this graph, uh, 0, 0, 0 is adjacent to three other vertices by just changing one of its coordinates. Okay. And for example, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 0, 1 are not adjacent because they differ in two coordinates. Okay, so this is our uh, definition of a discrete cube. But what does it mean to have an isodimension inequality for it? So we have to understand what a diameter means and what volume means. So vol for volumes, it's actually quite easy to define it. So the most natural way is to assume that there's a uniform measure on the vertices of the cube. So basically, you want to give every vertex an equal weight. And then the, for a subset of vertices, uh, its volume is just equal to basically how many uh, vertices you have. But what's a diameter? So in order to define diameter, we have to introduce a distance. And here, there's already a very natural distance given by the graph, which is the so-called Hamming distance. So in other words, you want to see between two vertices, let's say 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1, what's the length of the shortest path in this Hamming graph that connects them. And this is exactly the Hamming distance. So you just compare these two vectors and count how many coordinates they are different. All right, so now if we like to develop isodimension equality, so the question becomes the following. So for a subset of vertices with fixed diameter, so in other words, you want to make sure that the pairwise distance of to any two vertices in this set is at most a certain value. They want to ask at most how many vertices you could find. So let's do this example. So let me, sorry, let me erase this, highlight in here. So let's say if we like to find the, a maximum subset of vertices so that their pairwise distance is at most two here. Okay, so let's try to see how many vertices we can find. So we can take, let's say, 0, 0, 1. I can take 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. So you can take a two-dimensional subcube. Then, of course, every two vertices are at distance at most two. Uh, but this is not the only way to get four different vertices. So for example, you can also take 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. And the reason is that this is a sort of hammering ball of radius 1 centered at this vertex 0, 0, 0. Now from triangle equality, you know any other points are at distance at most twice of the radius, which is 2. So for this example, they give you, I mean, most constructions give you four, and that's the best case you can do for this, I mean, for this special instance. But for larger n, it turns out that all the having ball always does better. So this is the so-called Kleinman theorem back in the 60s, 70s. So if f is a collection of binary vectors in the n-dimensional space, uh, 0, 1 to the n, and you assume that the diameter is at most d. So here we require that this is really less than n, otherwise the problem will contribute. You can just take everything. Now the maximum size of f you could have is you take a Hamming ball of radius d over two. Okay. Now you may want to ask me what happens if d is odd. Then you can take a very similar construction. So you can let the first coordinate be either zero or one, and then there are n minus one coordinates left. You take a Hamming ball radius d minus one over two centered at this zero. So basically, for the first coordinate, you can choose anything, and then there are uh, there are at most d minus one over two ones in the last n minus one coordinates, and this will be the optimal construction. So for Kleiman's original proof, he used a somewhat complicated combinatorial shifting technique. 
And it turns out that actually climate theorem also follows from a careful use of the inertial bound. So I hope you still remember what the inertial bound is. It tells you that alpha of three is less or equal to the number of non-negative eigenvalue and the number of non-positive eigenvalues. And uh, you can take the minimum here, of course. But if you pay more attention to the proof, you will realize that we don't really need to take the adjacency matrix of this graph G. We can take a so-called pseudo adjacency matrix. So what do I mean is the matrix still have to be symmetric. Otherwise, the Cauchy interlay theorem may not apply. Also, you need to keep the zero entries because for the proof, we need to make sure that if we look at our independent set, this gives you an all zero principal sub matrix. But to be honest, we don't really need to use the ones here. So you can change one to anything you want. You can change it to zero, change it to 100, or maybe even negative numbers. As long as the matrix remains symmetric, you can pick your favorite such matrix and this, this, N, this number of non-negative and non-positive eigenvalues still give you an upper bound on the independence number. So this is a technique that's extremely useful. And in particular, if you choose a pseudo adjacency matrix for a graph related to this collated Kalman theorem, you can just show that this follows immediately from the inertial bound. So, okay, so here, first of all, you have to uh, convert this to an uh, independence number problem. So it's very natural. So you just, again, take all these n-dimensional vectors to be a vertices. And if the Hamming distance is greater than D, then you put an edge. So now independence set basically corresponds to a family with diameter at most D. And then you can pick a pseudo adjacency matrix. So the way you choose a pseudo adjacency matrix is the UV's entry only depends on the Hamming distance between these two vectors U and V. So if you do it really carefully, you can make sure that uh, the number of either the positive or number of negative eigenvalues will be exactly equal to the size of this largest Hamming ball of radius D over two, and the proof will go through. All right, so now I'm ask why do we need to have a different proof since Kleiner already have a combinatorial proof? That's because, I mean, he used a sort of shifting idea. So it was very specifically when the distance set satisfies certain properties. So to see this, so let me slightly reformulate uh, uh, the disclaimer here. So let's say if we have a set L of distances that we are we along, and you define this function f sub L of n to be the maximum number of binary vectors of dimension n such that they are pairwise having distances in L. So Kleiman's theorem basically tells you what happens if you take L to be a set of consecutive integers starting from one, right? Because if the diameter is less or equal to D, then basically all the allowed Hamming distances are from one, two, three, up to D, okay? So in particular, if D is equal to two times T, which is an even number, then this is like the size of the Hamming ball of radius T. All right, so it turns out that our algebraic technique can be used to prove a lot of upper bounds just from properties of this matrix. So for example, if we consider uh, consecutive integers, uh, so here it doesn't have to start from an odd number and an even number, but just for simplicity, I will give you this case. So we can prove upper bound, which is basically of the order magnitude n choose t minus s. So, and if you directly apply Kleiman's technique, I don't think this will give you such upper bound. But here is there's a, still a question. So this might not be the best upper bound we can prove. So because uh, let's say if you want to establish a lower bound, you need to find a large family of binary vectors whose pairwise distance falls into this set. So the best construction we can find so far is only of order of magnitude n choose t minus s divided by t choose s. And here, this, there's, there's no division here, basically. So now we want to ask which one is closer to the truth here. So we don't actually know, but what we can do is for t equals s plus one, we can show that the lower bound is the, the, is the truth. So the lower bound is, I mean, the correct bound is actually roughly n to t minus s divided by s plus one. Mm -hmm. So I think this leads to a very interesting question. So is there still a potential to improve this inertial bound? 
So by considering a more delicate version of decade choice of the pseudo JCC matrix. So that's something that I would like to work on in the near future. Okay, so let me pause here for a moment to see if you have any questions. Okay, so if you ever have questions, please feel free to say it directly or type in the chat. All right, so for the next time, I'd like to talk about another use of interlacing in this time, in, you can say it's in graph theory or more, uh, in a wider sense in theoretical computer science. It's uh, my proof of this sensitivity conjecture. So here I would like to give you a very short introduction of this background. So we start with a Boolean function that sends n bit of 0, 1 to 0, 1. So for every such Boolean function, you can always write as a multilinear real polynomial. And the way of writing is actually unique. So for example, if you take the all function here, all function means uh, as long as you see one of the input to be one, then you output one. If only if all the inputs are zero, you output zero. So you can write this as a real polynomial in the form of one minus the product of one minus xi, right? If your xi is equal to one, then this is equal to zero, so it outputs one. And if all of them are zero, then get one minus one, which is zero. Okay, so now, of course, every Boolean, uh, I mean, if you think for a second, you can prove that every Boolean function is a, can be written as a unique real polynomial in this way. Multilinear means uh, there's no term of the form, let's say, S1 square. And that's because, you know, when Si only takes the value 0 or 1, the Si square is always equal to Xi, right? So you can get rid of these uh, higher order terms. And also you can see that not every multilinear real polynomial gives you a Boolean function. And this is probably why the study of Boolean function becomes so difficult. So the application of analytical tools is sometimes not enough. That's why sometimes we have to rely on purely algebraic tools. All right, so for a Boolean function in n variables, so we can define the so-called local sensitivity. So if you have an input x, then the local sensitivity is just the number of indices i such that f of x is not equal to f of x i. So here I have to tell you what this x i means. It means you switch the i's coordinate of x. So let's say if the i's coordinate is one, then you change this to zero. If it's zero, you change this to one. Okay, so just flip it. Okay, so for every input, you want to see how flipping each of its coordinate changes the value of this f at that input. So to count how so how sensitive this Boolean function is for that input at that input. So the global sensitivity or simply the sensitivity is just the maximum of this local sensitivity. So for example, if you look at the all function or the n function, then you can see the sensitivity is equal to n because uh, let's say if you look at the input, which is all zero, then you have to output zero. Right, but if you flip any coordinate from zero to one, it immediately gives you one. Okay, so sensitivity is equal to n. So once you have sensitivity n, you take the maximum is always also n. And now there's another. Uh, okay, so I mean the sensitivity is often used as a very useful measure of complexity of a Boolean function. And there's another measure called the degree. So here for us mathematicians, it's just the, it's very simple, it's just the degree of this f as a real polynomial. All right, so why is sensitivity interesting? Okay, so there, this sensitivity conjecture posed by Nisa and Sagetti in 1992. So they asked, is it true that the degree of any Boolean function f is bounded from above by a polynomial in the sensitivity of f? So basically, you want to see if this is there exists a constant C such that the inequality holds. And it turns out that before 2019, so there are a lot of complexity measures people study in theoretical computer science. They were all known to be polynomial related. So let's say if you have two measures, M1 of F and M2 of F, we say that they are polynomially related if m1 of f is less or equal to m2 of f to the power of c1 greater or equal to m2 of f to the power of c2. So it basically means if a Boolean uh, function is complicated in one of these measures, it's also complicated in the other measure. Okay. So once you know that two complexity measures are polynomially related, so often knowing 
properties or not, then gives you useful lower bound idea. Okay. So you know in computer science for a lot of problems, we are interested in proving lower bounds. All right, so at that moment, the only outlier was this sensitivity. And actually, people know just by definition that sensitivity is always less or equal to the block sensitivity. But the difficulty is if sensitivity bounded from below by a polynomial in one of these complexity measures. So that was unknown until 2019. And Scott Aronson's work, I mean, if we can solve this problem, then sensitivity will cease to be an outlier and joins a large and happy flock. All right, so in some sense, this sensitivity measures how smooth a Boolean function is with respect to the Hamming distance. So if you think for a while, you will realize that having low sensitivity means more smooth with respect to this Hamming distance. So if the sensitivity conjecture could be proved, it tells you that computationally, having a smooth or you can say low sensitivity function means that it's easy to compute in some of the simplest models like the deterministic decision tree model. So if you don't know what this is, doesn't matter. Okay, we are not going to use it. And also algebraically, it tells you that such function must have low degrees. So it's easy to express this as a polynomial. So earlier result tells you that for every function, you know the sensitivity is at most the square of the degree, and also, but, but for the other direction, it's difficult, and people only know exponential part of the degree in terms of the sensitivity, and that's why they want to know whether the uh, whether the degree is bounded by the sensitivity to the power of c. That was the conjecture. But before that, only the exponential upper bounds law. And the best separation people found was this so-called n of all function. So think of this as an n by n grid. So on each uh, cell, you have a, let's say an input. So first you do it for the rows, you take the all function for each row. And then overall, you take an n function. And this is so-called n of Oh. Now you can show that for this special Boolean function, the degree is equal to the square of the sensitivity. So in other words, it tells you this C, if, if there exists such a C, it cannot be less than two. Yeah, and that's the best separation known so far. Okay. I mean, there might be an example slightly improving this end of all function, but it still gives you two essentially. All right, and the reason that I became interested in this problem as you know, I'm a combinatorist and not a theoretical computer science scientist is because of a reduction of Gaussman linear in 1992. They showed that the, if you want to prove a polynomial, uh, let's say you want to prove a polynomial lower bound on the sensitivity as a function in the degree, then you just need to prove a polynomial lower bound for the following cross theoretic problem. So you consider this n-dimensional hypercube we defined earlier. You partition the vertices into, let's say, A and B. You want to make sure that this is not a balanced partition, meaning that they are not exactly half-half. And you consider the induced subgraph on these two paths. You take the maximum degree, you want to show that the larger one is at least h of n. Okay, so here's an example. So you take a three-dimensional cube, and let's say if you take the red vertices, then it gives you an induced subgraph uh, highlighted, I mean, with all these edges highlighted in yellow. And the other induced subgraph are this, uh, given by these blue vertices. So to show that at least one of them has large maximum degree. All right, so let's see why this is interesting, because if you can, Okay, so let me maybe put it this way. So if you here, you can prove a lower bound, which is like, sorry, for the graph theoretical problem, if you can prove a lower bound like square root of n, then this gives you that the sensitivity is greater or equal to square root of the degree of n. And actually, if, even if you do it with n to the power of 100, this will still prove the sensitivity congestion, but just with a weaker uh, upper bound. All right, so just like what I said, we just need to find such a polynomial lower bound on this hypercube problem. So previously, the, for the hypercube problem, the best 
result was sold by Feng Chang, Jordan Freddy, Frank Graham, and Paul Simo in the late 80s. So they showed that for the n-dimensional cube. Uh, if you take two to the n minus one plus one vertices, so if you take the larger part of this part by partition, then it gives you a maximum degree at least. Uh, sorry, there, there exists such a way to pick such an induced subgraph with maximum degree only root n. So if you think for a moment, then from this Gaussman linear reduction, it basically corresponds to the quadratic separation between the degree and the sensitivity. So this n of all function. And for the proof, they could show that any two to the n minus one plus one vertex induced subgraph has the maximum degree at least half times log n. And this is there's a log here, which corresponds to the exponential upper bound. So you have this sensitivity. Or let me put it in degree, it's less or equal to e to the sensitivity. All right, so, so basically we like to know uh, what happens for, for this graph theoretic problem. Is the answer log n or square root of n? So, so basically the result I prove is the following. So as long as you take more than half of the vertices of this n-dimensional cube, then the induced subgraph has degree, maximum degree at least square root of n. And now you may uh, realize that if you only take two to the n minus one vertices, then you could have an independent set. Right. For example, if you take all the odd vertices or all the even vertices, then it's an independent set with no edge, so the maximum degree is zero. But as soon as you have just one more vertex, then the maximum degree suddenly jumps from maybe zero to at least root n. All right, and this is why I said about like if you combine this with the Gaussman linear equivalence, it will give you a proof of sensitivity conjecture, and this bar is also sharp by this n of all functions. All right, so for remaining time, I'll just show you this two-page proof, but I probably need more than two pages of slides. So the first idea is we can actually consider the largest eigenvalue instead of the largest degree. And that's because if you start from any graph, then the largest eigenvalue is always bounded from above by the largest degree, bounded from below by the largest, by the square root of the largest degree. So see, our goal is you want to take Q to the N and you consider a two to the N minus one plus one vertex induced subgraph H. You want to find a lower bound of the maximum degree of H. So this lemma basically tells you that in order to bound this, you have to bound the largest eigenvalue of lambda, I mean, of, of this adjacency matrix of H. Right? Because here we are happy with any lower bound like n to the c, so we don't really care if we lose this vector of like one half of log. All right, to see this is true. So uh, I think the this inequality on the right here is actually pretty standard. You can find every textbook on special graph theory. So just take the largest eigenvalue corresponding to lambda one, and you fix its largest, fix its coordinate, which is largest in absolute value, and you apply the triangle inequality, and it will give you this bound. And for the other one, uh, we don't actually need to, eat, to use it in our proof of this uh, sensitivity conjecture, but this is the, our starting point. So let me explain where this comes from. So you see, every time when you delete an edge, the largest eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix can only decrease, it can never increase. So if you start from our graph, you delete all the edges, except for edges incident to the vertex that has the largest degree then you end up with maybe a bunch of isolated vertices and a star. And the eigenvalues of the star are exactly this. So it means that for the original graph, its largest eigenvalue has to be greater or equal to square root of this uh, delta of G. Okay. So knowing this polynomial relation is the starting point of our problem, of our solution. So we can consider the largest eigenvalue instead of the largest degree. Now, what's the benefit of considering the largest eigenvalue? Because we can apply cautious interlacing. So we have already seen this earlier. So cautious interlacing tells us the following. So you see, first we have a graph G and we have an induced subgraph H. Okay, let me use this notation. Okay. So now if you consider adjacency matrix AG, then AH is a principal submatrix of AG. Okay. 
So in particular, the largest eigenvalues of the AH is greater or equal to the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue of H. So here is because G has two to the n vertices and H has two to the n minus one plus one vertices. Okay, I mean, the difference is like exactly the difference of these quantities. So here I'm using this inequality here. Okay, so now if we can show that this is greater or equal to root n or maybe n to the c, then we are done. But what are the eigenvalues of the you know adjacency matrix of the n-dimensional hypercube? Yeah, unfortunately, we know it very well, and it has n plus one different values. So it goes from n down to minus n, so it's n, n minus two, n minus four, it decreases two every time until you hit minus n. And the multiplicities are given by the binomial coefficients n to i. But if you stare at this sequence for a moment, you'll realize that the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue is somewhere in the middle, which is either zero or one, which is terrible for us, right? Because then it just tells you the largest eigenvalue of this induced subgraph is at least maybe one. But this is trivial because we already know that the independence number of QN is equal to two to the n minus one. Then of course, if you take one more vertex, then you need to include some edge. So the massive degree is greater or equal to one. Yeah, it looks extremely trivial, but from here, we already know that if you take slightly more than one, let's say you take one half plus C times two to the N, then the largest eigenvalue is already greater or equal to some C prime times two N because of these binomial coefficients. All right, it doesn't matter. There's still a way to get around this. So if you look at the proof of the previous inequality, uh, you show that the, the largest eigenvalues at most the largest degree. Actually, the proof applies not just for usual adjacency matrix, but also applies for the so-called side adjacency matrix. And the proof is exactly the same. So what do I mean by side adjacency matrix? So basically, I have a zero uh, plus minus one matrix. So the diagonal entries are zero, the diagonal entry can be zero or plus minus one asymmetric. So if I have an edge, then I put either a plus one or minus one, and if there's no edge, I put zero. So it turns out that the exact proof was there, and you can take any side adjacency matrix of your graph. It still gives you, I mean, I mean lambda one still gives you a lower bound on the maximum degree of this graph. So this certainly gives us more flexibility. So if we can find a side adjacency matrix M of the large host graph Q to the N, such that it's two to the N minus one's largest eigenvalue is equal to square root of N, then we can use the same technique, right? So the largest, the, I mean, the maximum degree of H is greater or equal to the, the largest eigenvalue of this uh, principle sub matrix restricted on the vertices of H, and this is greater or equal to the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue of this n, which is a side adjacency matrix of G. And if you can show that this is root n, then we are done. Okay, so you don't have to start with the usual adjacency matrix of the cube. And it turns out that such matrix actually exist. So we can define this recursive list. For example, you can start from this. 0, 1, 1, 0, which is the usual adjacency matrix for the one-dimensional Q. But for the two-dimensional Q, we do it a little bit differently. So we put a positive sign here, positive sign here, positive sign here, but negative sign here. And then you just do the same recursively. So for example, for the three-dimensional one, you just copy the two-dimensional side adjacency matrix. And you, for the vertical ones, you always put the positive sign. And for the bottom cube, you put a side different from the top one. So it's negative, 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 and plus. Okay. And this is why for the, this matrix, you have it in this way. Now you can prove by induction that the square of this matrix is equal to n times i. And therefore, all the eigenvalues are either square root of n or minus square root of n. And because the trace of this matrix by definition is equal to zero, so half of them are root n, half of them are minus root n. So the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue sorry, is equal, let's try to use this thing, is equal to square root of n here. And basically this finishes our proof. So here I just want to say that the choice of this matrix is not arbitrary. 
because there's a harder mass inequality telling us that if you start from any m by m matrix, it doesn't have to be symmetric. And you assume that the row vectors are vi, then the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix is at most the product of the lengths of these row vectors. I mean, geometrically, it just tells you the volume of this, I don't know how to call it, like a parallelogram, but for higher dimensions, is at most the product of the, its side lengths. Okay. And from this geometrical interpretation, it's not hard to see that the equality is achieved if and only if all these row vectors are pairwise or orthogonal, right? You have a cube here. All right, now, why is this related to this construction of MF? That's because for our purpose, we need to find a side adjacency matrix of Q to the N. And this already tells you how many one or minus one you have on each row, right? Because this hypercube is an N regular graph. So on each row, you see N plus minus one and the rest are zero. So each row vector has length exactly square root of N. So the determinant is bounded from about by square root of n to the power of two to the n. And the two to the, if you want the two to the n minus one's largest eigenvalue to be at least root n for our proof to go through. So you need the determinant to be at least root n to the power of two to the n. Why is that? You see, the first eigenvalue is at least root n, second one is at least root n. So when you go to half of these eigenvalues, they're all at least root n. But the hypercube is actually a bipartite graph. You can prove that if you take any of the side adjacency matrix for a bipartite graph, its eigenvalue are again symmetric about zero. It means all the negative eigenvalue has to be less or equal to minus root n. But the determinant is just the product of these eigenvalues. So you can see the absolute value cannot be too small. So from here, you see the determinant has to be exactly equal to root n to the power of two to the n. Then by, half, by the equal, when the equalities attend for harder mass inequality, we know that you really need to look for a matrix with this property, and that's why we came up with it. Okay. All right, so I'm almost done, so I just want to use the remaining time to talk about a couple of interesting open problems. So my favorite one is probably the, this one. So you see, previously, we have found a side adjacency matrix of this n-dimensional cube so that all the eigenvalues are either root n or minus root n. In other words, the special radius is equal to root n. So the maximum absolute value is equal to root n. So b root and linear has this beautiful conjecture. Is it true that for every deregular graph, you can find such a plus minus one zero side adjacency matrix whose eigenvalue all lies in this interval. So the special radius is at most two times root d minus one. So here, let me show you just a very basic example. If you take the Peterson graph, you can put positive sign on all the blue edges. And uh, let me answer this question a little bit later, okay? So I put all the signs on the negative negative sign on the red edges. And this gives you a sign adjacency matrix. And you can realize that the special radius is equal to root five. And root five is less or equal to two times root three minus one, which is root A, I think. So this is, actually this is the best and the smallest special radius you can achieve for Peterson square. Yeah. Okay, and if this is true, then this will actually imply the existence of infinitely many deregular Ramanujan graphs for every value of D, which is a pretty important problem in the construction of expanded graphs. And there's another lovely project. So if you still remember in the beginning, I asked you what's the maximum number of sets in the intersecting family. So here, if you are not allowed to take every set, but you're only allowed to choose from set from a so-called uh, abstract simply so complex, or you can call it a hereditary family, we satisfy the following property. So whenever you have a set in your family, all the subsets of it is still in the family. So this is an example of a simply so complex. Then the conjecture by Fata in 1974 asked, is it true that the maximum intersecting family, subfamily of this family is given by taking everything contains one or everything contains two, everything contains uh, mm. sub n. So you just want to take the most popular element. And this is still open. And there's a seemingly unrelated question asked by the geometers, the so-called Kuznas conjecture. 
But I somehow feel that maybe some special techniques can be useful here. So the question is the following. Is it true that in the n-dimensional Euclidean space, you can find at most two n distinct points such that they're pairwise, the so-called Manhattan distance are all equal. You can assume that they're all equal to one or two. So L1 distance just means the sum of Si minus Yi, I from one to n. So here is the example of getting two n distinct points. So I mean, if you consider other distance like the L2 distance, and it's actually simple. The best you can do is to take a regular simplex. And for the L infinity distance, you can take all the vertices of an n-dimensional cube. And, but somehow for L1 distance, the best upper bound one can prove so far is only n log n. So it looks pretty difficult to establish this result. Okay, so now let me just take a look at this question. So uh, for example, if we have a symmetric matrix A, B, C, D, can we use the concept interlacing to find the spectral of M? Let me see. Well, well, I think for this matrix is already given, right? So, uh, but maybe you don't know what C and D are, right? So I don't think you can fully determine the spectral of M uh, using this information, but you can get some nice upper and lower bounds on certain eigenvalues. So that's my guess. So yeah, I don't know if that's true. All right. So thank you all for your questions and your comments. And it's my great pleasure to give a talk. Okay. okay thank you very much, Professor Hao Huang, to give a very nice talk. And before we continue to uh, discussion sessions, uh, maybe uh, one of you uh, want to ask some questions. So I will, uh, maybe uh, first we have uh, intermezzo from Professor Aditya Baskoro. <laughs> okay, well, great. <laughs> yes, uh, thank, thank you. Uh... Uh, Professor Huang for the nice presentation and nice talk. Uh, we present you now uh, a song, uh, but this is uh, from Anklong Instrument. Uh, this is just for uh, dedicated to, to you, How? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so let me... Uh, can, can you stop the screen? Screen sharing, please? Yeah, okay, great. Yes. Now, uh, I'm here. This is just invitation to go to Bandung for you. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the bit. This is performed by our students.
Okay. Thank you very much. This is definitely one of the most special experience. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. So, so what does Manuk Dadali mean? Manuk Dadali is the uh, uh, name of the uh, bird. Dadali, Dadali is the name of the bird. Mm -hmm. So okay. what's the name of the instrument? Anklong. Anklong instrument. Anklong, okay. Yeah, this is bam bamboo, mm -hmm. uh, from bamboo. Yeah, from bam bamboo instrument. Mm -hmm. But now it's already modernized by uh, uh, our iPhone, uh, our yeah, phone. Yeah, some people are speaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, go, go back to Suhadi. Pak Suhadi. Okay, thank you, Professor Adi. So now we start the discussion sessions. So maybe uh, if you want to have uh, if you have a question, so maybe you can ask directly uh, to Professor Huang, or maybe you can uh, type on chat room. Uh, two previous uh, questions has already uh, answered by Professor Huang, I, I guess. So maybe uh, the, last, the last one. The last one is not yet probably. It's already. Already. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, can I ask another question? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, in the improvement of Erdos Corrado, so you mentioned if it's greater than or equal to k square, is easy to get the result. How about if I change the two to one plus epsilon for arbitrary epsilon greater than zero? Uh, I think you can probably prove it for uh, n greater or equal to c times k for sufficiently large c as well, but, but I did not really remember if people have done this. So, I think that real difficulty is to bring it down really close to two times k. So, so it's not known to us like k square or k to the one plus epsilon. I think it's also known for c times k or sufficiently large c. So, mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I think this may, this may only work for two degrees. So I'm not sure what happens for three degrees and, or, or above. Mm. Ah. Yeah, but personally, I still believe that there should be a pretty neat result that gives you the precise range, just like the one degree case. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay, another questions maybe? Or maybe from Professor Eddy? Okay. If there is no others, then uh, I will ask uh, well, just just one question. Um, I, I know that you work a lot on uh, various conjectures that you shown uh, just recently. Uh, I just wonder, do you also work on uh, Ramsey numbers or Ramsey uh, uh, minimum graph? Uh, <laughs> I have a very ambitious project trying to apply yeah. the lacing for the diagonal Ramsey number, but of course, so far I haven't gotten anywhere. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, yeah, uh, like uh, to to apply uh, algebraic uh, methods uh, mm -hmm. in uh, determining whether a graph is a graph Ramsey numbers, a uh, graph Ramsey minimals probably will be will be a good idea as well. Yeah, I like the study of Ramsey number, but I know very no. little about data mining, of course. Yeah. yeah, I can tell you one thing I'm interested in. For example, what's the click number of Pelly graph? Yeah. I still um, don't know. Yeah. I mean, the best of a bar is only like maybe root uh, p over 2. Yeah. Uh -huh. But people believe it maybe it's like log p square. So, so recently I've been trying some of these special techniques to establish better upper bounds. Okay, <laughs> great, great. Yeah. And what about the graph labeling, like edge magic labeling? Uh, I know there's a lot of interesting conjectures there, but I never really you know, look into the problem. <laughs> I think people saw me for various special graphs. But it looks uh -huh. like the conjecture is full generality is still quite out of reach. <laughs> uh -huh. OK. I mean, it's like this graceful tree conjecture. Graceful, right? yeah, yeah, graceful as well. I, I just saw a recent paper claiming approval. I don't know if people agree that it has been set up. So. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. 
Burino, probably you want to ask some question. <laughs> oh, uh, probably not. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> you you can ask uh, when when uh, uh, how uh, will come to Bandung. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be ha happy to go anymore, but as long as there's no COVID, no quarantine. Okay, no great. COVID. So yeah. So whenever it's uh, ready, the situation, then uh, a better situation, then I will invite you to come to Bandung. So what's the best reason to visit there? The best reason? Anything? Uh, June, July, I, see. I think. Uh, also, anytime. Yes. Bandung is always fine. Always yes. good. Good condition. <laughs> because in Singapore, I think almost every is right on the equator, right? So every, almost every day we have the same. So I guess it's different for other countries. <laughs> Probably January, yeah. a lot of rain, yeah. Uh, December, but late December, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, others, I think it's okay, yeah. It's fine, yeah. The, the weather here. Mm -hmm. Weather in Bandung is uh, nicer than uh, in Jakarta, probably. Yeah, it's, it's nicer. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, actually, is this famous swim named after the city or, or the other way around? So, this, uh, you know, this Bandung, this beverage. Uh, I know if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I think this uh, usually means red beverage, right? So, there's a chain called Bandung. So. Yes, yes, it, it yeah. is called Bandung in Singapore, but oh, okay. Oh, so yes, but, but, but but in here oh. it, uh, we call it differently. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> it's es campur. Ba it's, Bandung it's, ice. Yeah, Bandung. Oh, yeah, yeah, es campur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so probably it's, from Bandung, as you call yes, it. Yes, <laughs> it's like mixed ice or something. We call it like that in here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, Bandung is uh, famous for the culinary. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of uh, nice uh, food and uh, others, yeah. <laughs> and also nice cafe there in Bandung. You know, after I moved to Singapore, I really like the, you know, the diversity of food there. And I guess in Indonesia, you probably have more delicious cuisines there. Right? <laughs> okay, but so Adi, probably uh, you want to ask some question or? Uh, Pak Nanga, please, Pak Nanga. No question for a while. Thank you so much, <laughs> Pak Adi. <laughs> okay. Silakan, Pak Adi. Back to Pak Adi now. Okay. Maybe uh, for some participants who want to ask uh, questions to Professor Hong Huang. Okay. Okay. Everyone mm -hmm. here feel that uh, the topic is heavy. <laughs> yeah. so we, we need to uh, uh, digest. Oh, so it's a Saturday afternoon, right? So maybe <laughs> you have more fun here instead of listening to a talk. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, yeah. So, 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 so that's why it's better you come to Bandung to to give not uh, to discuss uh, to give some discussion again with us. Yeah. yeah this time I make sure that I will not give a call on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, if there's no questions, maybe uh, I will uh, end this session for presentations. But uh, before we, we close this combinatoric studio series, uh, I believe that Professor Adi have something to be uh, given for, uh, for Professor Huang. Okay. <laughs> okay. Terima <laughs> kasih. Yeah. So uh, thanks again to Professor Hao Huang for wonderful and inspiring talk today. And thank you as well to everybody here uh, attending this uh, uh, program. And for uh, <clears throat> our appreciation, we will give some certificate as well as some uh, small token from uh, from us so let me share with you here okay so, uh, haha. so this is the certificate professor Ho Huang 
And this is uh, your photo. <laughs> so, so we thanks uh, uh, to you yeah, for his uh, profound uh, lecture in, at ITB Combinat Directory Series today. Yes, I really appreciate the effort you put on organizing this kind of talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I will send this to a uh, uh, file to you uh, later. Yeah. Okay, so this is the end of our program today. So thank you, Professor uh, Hao Huang, and thank you to everybody here. So see you next uh, next month, next two months, because on May we will have uh, off. Yeah. I mean, no uh, session, no, uh, yeah, no session. But on June, we will have uh, another session of uh, combinatoric to this series. Okay, terima kasih banyak. Bye bye from now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> terima kasih semuanya. I have to. Close, yes.